guys hear me fine? Is the mic working? I'm standing up here, so I can switch to slides. Um, so I'm Lucas. Um, great to meet you uh, all. Um, I'll be talking about lessons learned from Product Hunt. So Product Hunt is a startup where I was part of the founding team almost two years ago now. Um, and we use Postgres. Um, and so basically, we want to talk about all the you know, details of like issues we run into. Not as much as scaling out, um, but much more like how does the development team interact with the database? Um, and like which issues do we run into specifically when developers write this to us? Um, or use more around um, and run these issues. All right. So uh, quickly about me, just to get a little context. So I did build a tool called PG Analyze some time ago, um, which I'm still uh, operating. Um, it's like a hosted monitoring dashboard for Postgres. Um, a lot of my personal lessons learned come from that, uh, working with people on their Postgres databases. Uh, I actually recently joined Sites Data. Um, so I left Product Hunt a couple of months, uh, weeks ago. Um, and now work for Sites, uh, focusing on their like, part monitoring, part uh, other new products that we will announce today at the keynote, uh, like sponsor keynote, that's like again. Um, but this talk is about Product Hunt. So Product Hunt is a community platform. You can kind of say like Reddit, um, but for products. And so you can see, you know, you have like a list of posts. Um, you have like people interacting, with people upvoting. Uh, it's like all the value is basically on the front page. Um, and then if the front page doesn't work, people would recognize it quite quickly because you know like millions of people visit that page. Um, and so it's like quite important that the page shows something, um, and we can't just take it down. Easily. So the structure of this talk is going to be, I'll first of all talk just about the architecture. Um, I'll say up front that the Postgres architecture might not be as interesting, but more like the services around that and how we use the data that's in Postgres in other parts of the system. Um, then I'll talk about the problems that we face uh, using Postgres. So this you know, kind of going into details like locking, schema changes, these kind of things. And then I'll talk a little bit about developer education, like teaching app developers how to use Postgres. Because um, I did encounter issues there. I was the person with the most Postgres knowledge on the team. Um, and you know, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen this before on Peter's side as well. Um, and then fourth, uh, time for Q&A. If there is a question in the meantime, like if you feel it's really pressing and you want to have something answered, please raise your hand. I'll try to uh, do it during the talk as well. But for most questions, I'd say keep it to the end. All right, so product and architecture. So, and this might be a bit hard to see, so I'm just like, uh, I'll try to repeat it. Um, so Product Hunt uses uh, Ruby on Rails as its main um, application framework. Um, and all the users go to Rails. Um, no users go for any other part. Um, so Rails is the part of the complexity lines. Um, Rails then obviously goes to Postgres. Rails also goes to Redis, um, which is actually not connected to Postgres right now. Um, we've been looking into that, but it's not, like right now it's separate. Um, and it's used for caching, uh, mostly. And then there's also something called feed service, which I'll talk in a moment, um, which is quite interesting, where we kind of use list and notify to get data out of Postgres. Um, and then going on from Postgres, there is a part where we do analytics. So basically, set up a like replica or slave, like master slave setup, using stream replication, where we basically run a list of queries. We use a, a partner called Periscope Data, which can combine that um, Postgres data with Redshift data and make it accessible. And then, obviously, we also have backups. Uh, there's also a component where we kind of uh, help developers have a production database, which uh, is safe to use, uh, like a copy of the production database, which is safe to use. All right, so actually, who knows Listen and Notify? Just to check. Okay, so who does not know Listen and Notify? Okay, very good. Then I need to explain what Listen and Notify is. Um, so, Listen and Notify is basically a mechanism where you, like, you can, like, one client uh, connected to Postgres listens, and then inside Postgres you can basically notify about events. So one thing you can do with it is, like, every time a new record gets inserted, you basically create a notification. And another part, like, another part of your application could listen to that and, you know, write this to another database, uh, output the log, um, and so on. So it's basically a communication mechanism. And so the way we use that is, and this is, I could talk at length about this, <laughs> Have to do the Zoom and QA part. Um, but the gist is, like, there's a part of the site where Postgres wasn't the most effective thing to access, basically, right? So, like, even though we could do indexes in Postgres, 
we needed a certain structure of the data, and we needed this to be special to a certain user's content. Right? It's like you, you're logged in, you have your friends using the site, and you want to see content that's specific to your social context. And so what we ended up doing is building a basically a, a daemon that uh, stores in memory a certain data structure, which you can access based on your user ID. And then it would give you, like in this case, like while you're away, like these five posts you should look at. And this daemon basically built this data structure and kept it up to date using list of stuff. So basically, it would start up, it get, get like a full copy of the relevant data ID, um, and then it uses uh, like listens to all new data coming in and continuously updates. And so this is kind of that part of the architecture. Um, and this, like, the reason again why we did this is because Postgres, for this particular use case, wasn't fast enough, and it was also not like. Um, delivering the right speed, basically, like it would, you know, would vary. Um, and we knew very specifically what structure we wanted. Uh, another thing in that architecture which is interesting is we, um, so we want to give the developer a full copy of the production database, which in the case of product hunt actually is not that bad, like it's less than on a gig. Um, and we want to do that because we, if you create an index, you, or like if you make a decision to create an index or not, you should do this ideally on a table that has the right size. Um, and also, if you build a feature, it's really helpful if you have historic information. Um, but what we don't want is like people's emails uh, on developers' uh, laptops, right? Um, and so, again, there's more details to that. Um, but essentially, we did a PG dump uh, using Postgres's uh, logic there. Um, did a PG dump uh, to a separate app. That app would import the PG dump, clean the PG dump, like remove emails, uh, remove other like sensitive information, create a new backup. Um, and then developers could basically like get this new backup every 24 hours, um, and that's been really helpful. Like for developers, it's just one command, um, and they have like a fresh copy of the production database. All right, um, and then another piece in this setup is analytics. Um, so obviously, any startup wants to know, you know, are we actually growing? Can we raise another uh, round of VC financing? Uh, all these nice things, um, and so. What was really important here is like basically setting this up so that we could get data out of the queries without affecting the production workload. Um, and then also we had a secondary system which would track user activity. You know, people click this and this, uh, like behavior basically. And this was like through another company, they put data into retro. And then we used a tool called Periscope Data, um, which are Postgres shop. Um, and they basically built kind of like the AI tool based on SQL. Um, and they have a really nice mechanism where you can have multiple databases and they all, you see all of them as one Postgres, um, which you can run the SQL queries on. And this has been really useful where we basically created dashboards based on SQL, um, combining our own database with other like, retro databases. Um, and they also have a really good talk on this. So if you're interested in how they're doing their caching and like their summary, like collecting uh, information across multiple databases, uh, I'll post these slides online. Uh, you can watch them on YouTube. It's really good. Um, all right, second part, or actually any big questions for the first part. Um, second part, uh, problems that we've run into. So one, and this kind of, like in this part I kind of want to talk about, you know, obviously if you build your app, you have like a working app at one point, then you can build your structure as you want it. But then your app keeps changing, right? especially in a startup, your changes are like every day or every week. Um, they're not every month, right? It's like you actually need to optimize for change to optimize for the speed of change. Um, and so one thing we use our Roku, um, we also use our Roku Postgres. Um, and so if you use our Roku, you can enable something called the rolling deploy, uh, which means when your app deploys, uh, your old version of the app is still running. And you basically, you deploy a new version, then the old, actually it's now the new version is already up and running and uh, accepts your request. And so the issue that you have here is when you make a structural change to the database, like say remove a column or change column's name, that when do you run this migration, right? Like when do you make this change to the structure? And so I'll go into more detail on the next slide, but basically the gist of this is you make an initial structure change. Right, so you make a change that's actually safe to do at any time. Like the old code can, like, is stable to run on that change, which could be you add a column, right? Or if you want to re rename a column, you still need to add a column, um, fill it up with data, and then like remove the old one afterwards. 
Um, so you add a column or you basically make the structural change which wouldn't impact the running code. Um, you deploy the code, you like wait for it to fall over. Um, and then you migrate the data, which if, for example, you add a new field, which is a default value, um, in that case, you would actually need to populate that all the old rows with that default value. Um, but you don't want to do this at a, like whilst holding a lock, right? So like you want to do this at a time where your code is already deployed, um, you already made the structural change, you run a script which might take hours to complete, which backfills the database's default value. Um, and then you finish this migration by uh, switching like either the default on for all new columns um, or like uh, setting a not null, for example. And so basically you have to think through these things always. Um, another thing that we encountered uh, was lock contention. And so by that I mean we, um, like the main like um, object on Product Hunt is a post, right? So like people make a post on the site and they write comments on that post. Um, and so the issue that we ran into, um, Rails has a thing called a counter cache and Rails also has timestamps. So a counter cache would be this post has 20 votes, right? There's actually, t there's a post, um, post votes table which contains the individual votes, but then there's also a post votes um, integer on the, um, on the post table, which kind of caches it so you don't always have to count the, the rows. Um, and similarly for timestamp, a timestamp on post it would say like last updated at, and every time somebody votes that updated at gets, gets set to now um, with the intention of uh, busting caches, right? So like when you have a cache and you know, okay, the update that changed, so I need to kind of fetch the new value. And so the issue you run into, um, might be a bit hard to see, but so basically something that Rails, and this is really Ruby and Rails' fault in a sense, um, something that Rails likes to do is it likes to do transactions. Transactions are awesome, right? But the issue is um, if you open a transaction, then you make a lot of changes or like you, you do things and then you close the transaction like 10 statements later or 15 statements later. Um, the issue is if you make an update statement in the beginning of that transaction, um, every other like uh, concurrently running worker uh, is gonna block, right? Like every other transaction that's also on that row um, is actually gonna wait for a transaction to complete. And this might not sound like a big issue, um, but let's say you have a, like Twitter launches a new product on Product Hunt, um, and you have thousands of people upvoting at the same time, right? And so like every single upvote means that it runs through these like 15 statements, and every one of these statements is run from the app, goes a round trip to the database, goes back, like um, it's really slow actually, right? Um, and so the issue becomes that that single row that you want up, are trying to update basically becomes a point of contention where all these like, um, all these concurrent connections are trying to work on the same record. Um, the fix here is to really think uh, closely when you're issuing an update statement, right? So like in this case, for example, does it actually need to do five updates? Um, like it actually, and this is like Rails doing bad SQL, right? But like essentially it's doing initially and repeating it because it's a bit hard to see. Um, it's updating the user's table for some reason. Um, then it's updating the post's table, set, setting the vote count. It's updating the post table again to set the credible vote count. Um, it's updating the user's table again. Um, and then it's updating the post table again to set the updated at timestamp for the caching. Um, and all during that time, the lock on users and also posts is being held, right? Um, so really try to like optimize these things away. Similarly, if you're looking into locks issues, uh, like people might notice, but like um, there's something called the deadlock timeout, which is basically the time until Postgres checks if a transaction is like stuck in a deadlock with another transaction. Um, you can also enable something called lock lock waits, um, which would give you like basically after this deadlock timeout when Postgres already checks on a lock, um, it will also tell you that it did that. Um, so you can easily see like which um, transactions are problematic. Um, it's a bit hard to read, but it does help you like say, okay, this table has an issue. Um, and also how often it has that issue. And then in Postgres 9.6, there's actually a really nice addition. It's a bit technical, but like this really nice addition where like stat activity, which shows you the, the current connections, um, also shows you if a connection is, like if a query is waiting for something, it will show you what lock, what kind of lock it's waiting for. Um, and you can then determine, you know, is this actually Postgres having some lock contention inside? Is it like you writing bad code? Um, that kind of stuff. 
All right. Um, similarly, uh, idle transactions. I'm actually curious, who has encountered an issue with idle transactions? Okay, a couple of people. Uh, those people who have probably set up monitoring afterwards because idle transactions are horrible. Um, <laughs> or prevent people from using a production database. Very good. Uh, <laughs> that's, I mean, it's, it's a uh, good way of doing it. Um, you can also like, I think it's 9.6, you can now set a timeout for a transaction. But so basically, this is an actual issue we had, is like um, you have a process that opens a connection, um, that opens a transaction, um, even worse, makes an update statement, for example, um, and then the process crashes. But for some reason, the process crashes in a way where it's not actually exiting. It's stuck in a weird memory leak type of loop. Um, and in Ruby, this happens. Um, and so the issue then is that other statements start to pile up because of that transaction. Um, you have both a locking issue. You also have technically an issue of transaction wraparounds. Um, but here it's, really, um, here it's really about the issue that uh, you have this thing which is not doing anything anymore, but it's taking a resource and it's locking a resource. Um, and then if you want to debug this, like there's queries for that. There's also, like if you use Heroku Postgres, there's a great tool called PG Diagnose, which will show you this. Um, but basically it's something you really need to watch out for. Um, and similarly, if you have people using your database uh, and not using it properly, right? Like if you have analysts going to your production database, for example, then you have the same issue sometimes. Um, and here you can actually see, so in this case, this one query blocked it for one and a half hours. Um, and you see, I actually had to remove queries, like the long list on top is basically the queries that are waiting for that one connection to finish. Um, so, and then your whole system grinds to a halt, right? Because like all these other parts of the system are also waiting, so like then your web website becomes unresponsive and so on. Another um, good issue to run into is connection limits. So, Postgres has a connection limit, right? Every connection to the database takes up memory. Um, it's there for a reason, so you shouldn't set your connection limit to be 10,000, because your server's gonna run out of memory. Um, but it's still causing issues, especially if you have an application which just likes to open a connection, and then sometimes do a query, sometimes not do a query, but it keeps the connection open all the time. And so a nice way of showing how this can easily be an issue is like, um, so Heroku has something called a dyno, which is basically like a container, you could say. It's like one instance of your app running. For example, let's say you have 10 connections per dyno. Um, so maybe you have like five threads and like two processes in that dyno. Um, and then you have 10 dynos, which with Heroku is just a slider, right? Like I'm like, oh, well, maybe today I need five dynos. Oh, I need 15 dynos. Like you just change this without thinking much about it. And then you also have rolling deploys, which means there might be two instances of your whole application running at the same time. And so this kind of illustrates like 10 times 10 times two, um, you have 200 connections. Um, and this really becomes an issue to, the more you're like, oh, we'll just throw more hardware at this. Um, and then your max connections is just maxing out. Um, one way of like dealing with this, which we actually didn't implement in this case is PG Bouncer, for example. Um, so putting something in front which handles the connections for um, before a database. And then a database only gets the connections which are actually doing work. Um, so there's like ways of going around this, but you really need to watch out for it. Um, then another, and this is kind of a bigger topic, is um, if you wanna make a change to your schema, right? Like as I said, often it's the speed of change which is important, um, not as much like the getting it perfect from the right, um, from initial moment. Um, let me actually, yeah. Um, so kind of, this is a, list of six or seven things your developers should watch out for. Uh, and it's an arbitrary list, I'm sure there's many more. Um, but this is kind of when I, so we did like code reviews, right? It's like people would do a pull request and I would look through the code and I'd be like, oh, there's database migration. Um, and these are the things I would look for and developers often wouldn't take care of this. Um, so the first thing is you don't wanna remove a column on a large table. Um, why? Because it will take a lock and the, it will take that lock for quite some time. Um, and whilst that exclusive log is taken, uh, the whole read, write, like read especially, um, workload can't do its job. Um, which means people will wait for your website to load. Second thing is don't rename columns, right? Um, the reason why you shouldn't do it, so renaming columns is actually fast. Um, the issue with renaming a column is if your old code is still running and it tries to use that column, uh, then like, <laughs> like hell will break loose, at least for five minutes until new code goes into production. Um, and the way around this is basically, like you really have to be careful and like 
we fix this off by just not renaming things, right? So like in the database, it would be called a certain thing, and in the client, it would be called something else. Um, the way around this, if you want to have no downtime, kind of, um, is that you would create a new column, you would copy all the data to that new column, um, and then you would switch over, and at the point where you switch over, you actually have the full data in both columns. But it's per usually not worth the trouble. Um, always index concurrently. Um, so Rails has a lot of nice migration helpers where you're like, oh, let's add an index. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't default to use concurrently. Um, if you don't use concurrently when you create an index, it will take a lock. The whole table will be locked again, reads will uh, block, and so on. Um, so always index concurrently. Uh, when you change a column type, um, and like changing column types, for example, one thing that we had a lot was like, um, we had a lot of var chars in the table. People didn't use text, right? Var char is a useless data type. You should never use var char unless you really need to. Because um, especially like Rails puts a default constraint. So like if you tell Rails, please, I want a string in my database, um, it creates a var char column with 255 as a limit. Um, and then for some reason, you have a long URL, for example, and that fails. Um, and then you need a text column. So that stuff happens. Um, if you change column types, it again has to like look through every single like um, page and tuple. Um, in a table, um, in my understanding at least. Um, so try to avoid changing column types or again make this dance with like setting up a new column, copying the data over, um, and so on. Similarly, when you wanna like add a column with a default, um, it actually has to go back to all the old rows and add that default. So what you wanna do is you add the column without the default, you backfill, as mentioned before, you kind of backfill it in the migration, like a separate migration. Um, and then you switch on um, kind of the default for all new columns. Same thing for not null, right? It's like not null, I think it's really important to have, to do that stuff in the database, not just in the client, um, but it has the issue if you add a new not null column, then Postgres again has to check everything. Um, if you actually need a default for that, then you're gonna have this problem. Um, and then this is Rails specific, it's like there's a thing called disable DDL transaction, which um, like by default, which is good, Rails runs every migration to your database in a transaction. So you, like if something fails, it will roll it back. Um, the issue is if you, for example, use index concurrently, then you actually don't want that transaction. Um, and so, and also you can always recover from that, right? If you create the wrong index, you just remove it. Um, but you kind of need to be careful to add disable DDL transaction if needed. Um, and these are just the stats from like, and I basically just grabbed like our migration directory. Um, like in, uh, in Rails, every migration to your database is kind of a file. Um, and I just went through these files. Um, so in the last two years since like product hunt launched, we added 70 tables. Um, we removed 15 tables. Um, these were usually tables which we just didn't use anymore, right? So like we added a new table which did the same thing with a slightly different uh, layout. Um, and then we removed the, the table when nothing was using it anymore. Um, we added more than 100 indices, um, oftentimes too late. Um, like we added an index at the point where we should have, you know, done it a week ago. Um, and then we added 180 columns, which kind of shows again, you know, 180 times we actually had to evaluate what kind of lock is this taking, how long. Um, a couple of times we didn't evaluate it correctly, then the site was down for five minutes. Uh, so it's like, you kind of uh, get used to that. Um, and then we also removed 45 columns. Um, separately from the table. So like also the columns added is also not part of the tables. It's really like just a singular adding a column. Um, yeah, and then we change the defaults, nulls, and so on. <coughs> um, another topic, and one could talk about this, you know, you could talk about this for 50 minutes, is how to do pagination. Um, so who of you has run into pagination? Like who of you has done pagination using Postgres? Um, um, so the issue with pagination using Postgres is um, a lot of times when you think about pagination, you think about pages, right? So you think about page one, page two, page three. Um, that's actually really slow. Um, and the reason it's slow is because in order to go to like the first page or the second page, um, you actually have to load all the data. Like let's say I wanna grab the fifth page. Um, there's usually no good way of using an index for that. So it actually has to load all the five pages and then it only returns the fifth. Um, but it's really slow. And so, and this is something that most like tools also do, right? Um, but the much better approach is doing something where you basically say, I wanna have data which is older than this ID or created like older than this timestamp. 
Um, so I can actually use an index for this pagination. All right, any, I know this is a lot of content, so any questions to those first two parts? You mean to do the actual, like, do, to actually paginate, like, how to do it? Um, well, I mean, like, this, this really is if you, if you use these, you mean, like, pagination with pages? It's tricky. I, there, I don't think there's a good way to do it, to be honest. Um, you can, one thing you can try is you can estimate, kind of like, um, but it, this is, like, <laughs> the, um, actually, a col now colleague of mine wrote a good post on the Citus Data blog, um, where he kind of compared six different pagination methods. Um, if you just go to citusdata.com, um, I think it's the previous blog post or something. Um, there is a way to use, like basically use statistics to estimate where the page would be, and then you kind of use an index for that. Um, but it's really like, I would try avoiding that. Like for me, pagination means you actually need to go back to your product person or your developer and say, hey, like we shouldn't do pages, right? We should actually just do next, previous. Um, this is how I've usually treated it. I'd be like, it's a trade-off, right? Like we won't have pages, but it's much faster if we do next previous, or you do infinite scrolling, like you just like keep loading the data um, as you scroll down. So. Does it answer your question? Yep. Sorry, so you mean like, Yes, yes, so there is an issue, there, it's a very good point. So the question was kind of like, um, if we encountered an issue with like um, Rails failing because it was using an old plan because it uses prepared transactions. Um, it's a long topic, I actually initially wanted to include it in this talk and I didn't include it uh, for a reason. Um, so Rails by default runs everything in a pre prepared statement. Um, so that means, um, and it kind of does this for half security, half uh, other reasons, but um, the issue is, so we, to answer your question, we actually have, n have run into issues with that, but mostly using timeouts. So not when we make a change, um, but the issue is that Rails would basically, um, Rails internally keeps a cache of which prepared statements it kind of uh, created um, for, e for every query. Um, and then it tries to use that cache, and sometimes that cache gets poisoned by a timeout, and the timeout kind of corrupts the structure or something. Um, and then actually Rails just starts failing really oddly, like um, if you, encounter like prepared statement issues with Rails, uh, there is like, it's usually a timeout related issue. Um, but I can go into more detail if you want, maybe at the end. Um, all right, um, going forward, um, let me should check, are we on time? Cool, okay, so I think we got another 20 minutes. Um, so developer education. Um, so for me, this is really, and this is, you know, kind of something that falls on all of us. Um, I don't think, like I think you can do developer education inside a, an organization. Um, you also have to do it in general, like for the Postgres community, um, but just helping people use Postgres effectively. Um, and the first thing, of course, is explain, right? Um, actually, just to verify in this room, how many people don't know explain? Okay, cool, so you all know explain, very good. Um, but so in our company, I think at least half of the developers didn't know how to use explain, right? And like that means they can't verify if an index is being used. If they see a problematic statement, they don't know how to debug it. And so, you know, it might be as simple as just showing people, hey, you can run PSQL to your database, um, or maybe even to your staging database, um, and you can actually run and explain, analyze uh, with buffers turned on, for example, and you can actually see how much data is being returned from the database, how long every operation takes. Um, just showing that people already gives them like a really nice uh, power tool. Uh, another thing which is really good, which most of you probably know, is explain depeche.com, which is like 
great DBA guy from Poland, I think, who wrote a little tool to like visualize the explain output, which helps you identify the part that's slow in the plan. And then more recently, there was also somebody who created a more visual representation. Um, it's a bit hard to see here, but like basically, um, you know, he kind of rethought like, what if we showed explain kind of like PG admin, but like um, showing it bottom, uh, like top to bottom. Um, and really trying to be even more clear, like this is taking long, this is how much data it's fetching. Um, it's really like, I think we should invest much more in tooling like this to help people understand Postgres. Um, indexing is also a really long topic. Um, again, something which you can actually read on online very good. Um, I'll just t tell about one case that we had. So um, we had a, uh, we do something called live chats. Um, which is basically like online conversations with celebrities. Um, and one of them was Chick Dorsey, um, the Twitter CEO. And so we obviously knew that a lot of people would like come to the site to like follow Chick Dorsey and like interact with him in a Q&A session. Um, what we didn't know is that somebody in our team had added a new functionality like a day before um, and didn't add an index for that. And that functionality was basically responsible for like, sending in emails like 30 minutes before the chat. It would like send emails to everybody who subscribed, be like, hey, this chat is coming up. Um, and the issue is that it was kind of checking if it already sent the email in the database. Um, and for that check, there was no, um, there was like no index on that column. And so what happened is like starting 30 minutes before, but like it took some time, the whole site basically went down, right? And so like for the first, I think five or 10 minutes, like Chuck Dorsey was on his phone trying to answer live chat and people were trying to like access the site just because somebody forgot to add an index. Um, which I think, again, shows this is just about education, right? Like, you just need to be, if somebody makes a change to the code, they also need to make a change to the database. Um, and they really need to think about what they're doing. Um, and then kind of, kind of to finish out on this topic, um, I think we can really build better tooling. Um, one of the things that I've tried to build, um, and I'm still experimenting with this, uh, feel free to try it though. Um, it's a thing called DBLint. Um, it's only for Rails, so if you don't use Rails, it's not useful for you right now. Um, but basically it tries to use your integration tests to check the SQL for any obvious issues. Um, and this might be a bit controversial because it tries to simplify things. Because um, uh, it does try to tell you about missing indexes. Um, as every DBA knows, uh, missing indexes is a complex problem, right? So obviously you would, need to look at this, you'd be like, oh no, this is actually fine. Like we don't need an index on that. Um, the way it does that is basically, so like you run your feature test, right? Like where like it runs for the whole website. Um, it then disables sequential scan um, because usually the tables are too small there. It runs an explain and it tries to like go for the explain and basically see is there, like are we filtering on a table um, using a sequential scan? Um, and is the, like, is there an issue in there? Um, and again, this is not perfect, but it does help you to say, oh, we actually added something here and we forgot to add an index, right? And then this, uh, this test would fail. And similarly, like coming back to this issue of like long transactions, again, a real specific issue, um, you would actually, um, it, it kind of, um, like when you run your tests, it, it starts counting like when a begin statement comes in. And then for every new statement, it's like, it basically waits until the first update statement. And then from that onwards, it kind of starts counting. Um, and tells you how long a certain lock would have been held inside a transaction. And so here, and this sounds crazy, right? But like here, for example, you had a lock for 29 statements, right? So like, this means like maybe like 20, second, uh, 20 milliseconds round trip or something, right? So like you actually for a very long time have a lock that's held um, by a certain part in your code. Um, in this case, like accepting invitations. Um, but again, this is something that developers should know about. Um, Another really nice tool, and this is again real specific, but not, not built by me, uh, built by the um, great folks at Basecamp. Um, uh, they basically built a thing which annotates your SQL queries with like the place where they were called from. Um, so like telling you this application, this controller, this action, um, helping you understand like where a, a query comes from. And this can be really helpful like not as helpful if you use that statements because that statements would ignore the comment, um, but more helpful if you locked um, if you log certain statements to your like uh, Postgres log, um, and then it would actually show up and be like, oh yeah, this is like this is where the statement came from. And then so Square um, recent so Square is a MySQL and Cassandra shop, um, but Square released a tool called Shift, um, and Shift is basically 
Um, it's basically a tool for managing your migrations. So developers would basically go into Shift, they would say, here's my new MySQL migration I wanna run on the production database. Um, they would submit it, another person in a team would review it, just this like migration. And then they would deploy it. Um, and in the MySQL case, they use uh, Percona's tooling for like creating a copy of the table and like, like there's a lot of details there which are MySQL specific. Um, but the real benefit here is that you have a specific review tool for migrations, right, and for changes to your production database. And so I think that's also something which we should have for Postgres. Um, we should have a tool that people use to handle their migrations. We should have a tool that tells you you should use create index concurrently. Maybe you do need to create a copy of the table for some reason, right, but like kind of helps you negotiate, uh, like have that conversation. Yes, I know actually. Um, yes, better content. So we should uh, keep investing in the Postgres documentation because it's awesome. Uh, I think we still win um, having the best documentation. Um, but I think we also should you know, highlight other things. There's Postgres Weekly, um, which is like a weekly newsletter, um, really good to like see new content. Um, and then there's also a really nice site around indexing called Use the Index Luke, which every developer or like every app developer should know. Um, he has like a really nice way of visually explaining indexes like saying it's slow because of this and like uh, kind of helping people understand how the database fetches data. And it's, it's actually a free resource. Like he also wrote a book called Modern SQL, um, which you should buy. <laughs> but uh, it's a free website. People can just go there and look up things. Yes, and I think that's it. Um, questions? Sure, so removing a column is, is kind of specific. Yes, <laughs> well, there is no good solution. <laughs> um, it, I think it depends, so, and there, there's two sides to this, right? Like if you have a small table, you can usually just remove it, but you need to take care of the code that's still running. So for example, Rails actually keeps a cache of all the columns that exist on a table, and so every insert will start failing if we remove a column without updating the code. Um, so there's some stuff, like if you can actually remove it, there's still some stuff to take care of. Um, for large tables, we just didn't remove them. Um, <laughs> like the solution would again be, in my understanding, and other people might know better, um, solution would be to create a second table with the new layout, um, which is usually not worth the hassle, right? Because like a field that's null doesn't actually take up much space, so. Yeah, like, uh, sorry, say again. Yeah. But I think the issue, if I understand correctly, like the issue of a big table is still that it would have to rewrite parts, right? Because it's. Oh, I thought you were talking about the code errors. Yeah, it's a, there's like both sides, right? Like there's the code errors, and then there is the database like locks, which are held for a long time. Because um, in the end, the like motivation would be that you don't want to shut down your database, right? <laughs> so, um, um, I don't, yeah. Uh, and let me actually repeat the question. I just remembered that I should do that. Um, so the question was, um, in Rails, uh, like, are all the queries done using the ORM, or do we actually write our own queries as well? Um, so Rails does a lot of stuff in the ORM. Um, it also does a lot of bad stuff in the ORM. Um, like, up until most recently, it started, like, it always added an order by to a query, um, which would often mean that it couldn't use a certain index. Um, so Rails does, like, Rails does an ORM mostly, and it's sometimes bad. Um, we practically use that ORM for most simple queries. We often try, like for example, the ranking algorithm, right? It's like product, and, you know, like people are ranked based on votes, but then there's a like time component to it. Like it's a really complex uh, logic, um, and that's actually SQL, um, and that's obviously a custom SQL. Like it's like a, I think free line string or something, which just like maps that, um, and then like using using CTEs in some cases. Like if we basically anything around like combining like this table and this table and these people and like where you really need to like specify something more complex. Um, but does it answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> There's, I mean, yeah. 
Um, I think you can do a lot of good things with SQL, which Rails doesn't do, because Rails still tries to be compatible, right? Like Rails actually wants to be usable with MySQL, by Mongo, like uh, even though it, like a lot of people who use Rails use Postgres. Uh, Like SQL, the library? No, SQL Alchemy in Python. Oh, SQL Alchemy in Python. No, uh, it's much better. Yeah, it's, uh, like SQL Alchemy is much, much better than Active Record. Well, uh, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just to repeat the question, be sure, like, so you're saying, is there any downsides to using PG Bouncer because you lose some functionality, right? Like, is, would there be an issue with Rails? Yeah, like, uh, there's the issue with PG Bouncer. Like, if I use my Python to use PG Bouncer, can I use the third page to do that in Rails? Yeah. I think, so we, we didn't actually experiment with PG Bouncer on, on that product. Uh, I have tried it, like, if, if I'm trying to see if, I don't think I use it right now with anything, but um, I think the issue that people would encounter is as long as you use the mode of PG Bouncer where it maps one connection to another connection, it's fine, right? But as soon as you like start losing transactional semantics and so on, um, I mean, you can use it with Rails. You can turn off the prepared statements. People actually do that to work around these timeout issues. Um, so Rails can be fairly simple on that. Um, I don't know if the transactional, like Rails actually does like to use transactions a lot, so like it does often do a begin and commit. Um, that might be an issue of certain PG Bouncer modes. Um, but yeah, I don't have a really good answer because I haven't played as much as I'd like. Um. Uh, sorry. Uh, TCP as in like the transmission com control protocols, like network stack. I see. Um, we didn't, no. Um, so the question was if we ever like modified Postgres with like TCP or connection settings. Um, I, we didn't, no, we didn't modify that much. Uh, it might have been a good idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, like we, I mean, so a lot of the parts here with tuning Postgres, we also defer to Heroku Postgres because um, the, Database was at a scale where we were fine with doing that. Um, I do, like, personally have tuned databases on physical hardware. Um, uh, the database version? Um, database version was 9.5 now, 9.4 for a long time also. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question was um, for the like cleaning the personally identified information from developer copies, um, like what we used for that. Um, so no, we just built our own. Um, it was basically like a second Heroku app which would pull in a backup, uh, which would then also notify Slack so like developers would be, hey, like, <laughs> like a new developer dump is available. Um, it's, I mean, it's like 20 lines or 30 lines of code. I wish there was a tool for that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there's actually an issue on that that we sometimes forgot to add tables to that. So like, you know, you would add a new table which would track certain behavior, for example, and then you would forget to like, remo like change the cleaning logic. Um, yeah, but it's, I don't know like if there's any other tools that you would know, um, but. Yeah. <laughs> but like if, if you do know a tool for that, please let me know. Like, like. What's it called again? It's called Jailer. Jailer? Yeah. As in jail? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> We've actually been building it for work that we built it for. Awesome. Perfect. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter in this case, right? Like, as long as it works Postgres. Um, yep, yeah, sorry. Actually, 
we actually run them with mail migrations. Um, there is some tooling. <laughs> this is again, I mean, so the, sorry, the question was like if we export the migration to be like SQL and then run that SQL, or if we actually use, like Rails has its own built in tools for it. So it's like rake db migrate and then you like run a Ruby file which creates SQL on the, on the fly. Um, so we, we use a structure SQL, like we, we definitely track the schema in a, like a SQL um, structure, but we, like we just run a migrations as rake db migrate. Um, we do actually do it in a way, so basically we have a second app like when you deploy a new version of the code, it first deploys to an app called like product hunt dash db migrate and db migrate actually runs the migration and then it deploys, then does the actual deploy. Um, which kind of takes care of that like same issue where you wanna, um, wanna run the migration, like the initial migration you wanna run before the code change. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? All right, how are we in time? Are we, that's okay. Perfect, cool, then thank you. Um,